So Jonathan, here is a question for you. How large is Brazil? Uh, very, very, very big. <laughs> I think a lot of people, and especially me, maybe you as a European, you know, we really underestimate how large Brazil actually is. I have no idea how to express it, in fact. So if you were to combine every single one of the countries that make up the European Union, mm -hmm. Brazil is twice the size of that. So you're saying that basically Brazil is twice the size of pretty much the European continent. Now get this. Go on. Let's make a really crude assumption. Let's just assume that yeah. half the country could actually grow coffee. Seems plausible. So the potential that Brazil has for growing coffee is the equivalent of covering every square meter of the European Union with coffee trees. Good grief. If you live anywhere in Europe. Yeah, you walk out your door and you're in the coffee planter. I mean, <laughs> wow. It's just coffee trees as far as the eye could see. Now, Jonathan, of course, that's just a thought experiment, but like, how much coffee has Brazil actually grown over time? The amazing thing about Brazil is just the fantastic increase in output. So 1871, 3 million sacks. 30 years later, 1900, 15 million sacks. Mm -hmm. Another 30 years later, 1930, 25 million sacks. Fast forward 90 years, 2020, last year, 69 million sacks. Wow. So it moves from being you know, a significant mm -hmm. producer, but not by any means a dominant producer in the 1850s, and then bang, by the end of the century, Brazil, you know, it's just <laughs> over everything. Absolutely dominant. So Jonathan, this is what we're going to explore in this episode. Why does Brazil, mm -hmm. and especially Brazil, grow so much coffee? You mean, why is there an awful lot of coffee in Brazil, James? As Frank Sinatra once sang. And as we explore this question, we're going to touch on this really curious point in history where, you know, we're in a system of slavery capitalism and that transitions to post-slavery capitalism. What does that transition actually look like on the ground? Yeah. And the other side of the scale we're going to be exploring is well, who on earth is drinking all this coffee? You know what, James? Same people who are buying Frank Sinatra's records. Mm. I'm James Harper, the creator of Filter Stories, a coffee documentary podcast. And I'm Jonathan Morris, author of Coffee, A Global History. And this is A History of Coffee, a six-episode series where we explore how a tiny psychoactive seed changed the world and shapes our lives today. All right, so Jonathan, let's start at the beginning. How does coffee get to Brazil? origin story for this one goes that there's a guy called Francesco Paletta and he becomes an intermediary in a dispute between Suriname at that time, Dutch Guyana, and French Guyana at that time, next door to it. Okay. Uh, he's the mediator and they give him coffee. He heads down and he plants it in his native state of Para. Interesting. But when it becomes important is when it's taken out of Para and it goes down to Rio Interesting. and starts being planted around Rio. So what does Brazil look like before coffee arrives? Most of it, of course, looks like untamed forest. Hmm. So a lot of Brazil before coffee gets there is just a huge chunk of land just covered in forests and birds and bugs and, you know, nature doing its thing. That's exactly right. Yes, there are some indigenous Brazilians living there, but it's uncultivated, wild land. Right. And so coffee arrives, and you're saying that it eventually travels south, and it gets to Sao Paulo. Yeah. So geographically, like, picture that for me. Like, where is that? I'm going to 
apologize to any Brazilians listening, but if you want to kind of reduce Brazil to the shape of that big upside down triangle, then if you started shading in from the bottom of that upside down triangle, that's where most of the coffee is going to be. Okay, so let's zoom into Sao Paulo, zoom into that pointy part of the triangle. And I'm seeing miles and miles of forests, maybe a few kind of wooden hut settlements from colonizers. So tell me, what happens on the ground to make coffee grow so quickly in Brazil? Well, in the ground itself is very, very fertile. Mm. So you're probably seeing that red terra roxa, mm. the red clay soil. Right. As you swoop down, what you're probably seeing, James, is those forests are on fire. People are cutting down the forest, wow. burning off the trees, planting the coffee in the ashes. Wow. If you flew over a few years later, you'd also see one other thing and you'd see the first railways snaking down into Santos and Sao Paulo. Mm. So, in the 1860s, 1870s, so for example with Sao Paulo, why does Sao Paulo work? Because they build a railway to the interior. And once you build a railroad, you can ship all the coffee on the railroad. Huh. And that's why the port of Sao Paulo, which is known as Santos, that is how it becomes synonymous with coffee, because basically your rail links take you all the way down to Santos. I'd just like to contrast that with, say, Yemen, where yeah. if you want to know how to make coffee really hard to grow and very hard to transport, I mean, just look at Yemen. Yeah, it's an excellent contrast because everything is different. It's full of those tiny little terraces, tiny little peasant farms, basically. Mm. In Brazil, there are these huge plantations, enormous mega farms. It really seems like if there's any country that's going to do coffee on an industrial scale, it would be Brazil. Yeah, and that is exactly the right word. Industrial scale is what it is, yes. You have a terrain that's not too mountainous. You have the capacity to put in railways. It's also within the tropical belt. You have lots of land you can clear to grow this coffee. For the 19th, early 20th century, let's be clear, you know, coffee is the number one agricultural output in Brazil. Now, Jonathan, I know that coffee, when it was first introduced to Brazil, was grown using slave labor. Yes. So what's that story? It's estimated that 40% of all enslaved Africans ended their journey in Brazil. Wow. So it's a huge slave importing country and slave economy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely huge. This is how Brazil gets settled, colonized, land brought into production. It's these people. Hmm. And their conditions, as you can imagine, are far from great. About one in 10 of them die on the way over. They go into sugar planting initially, sugarcane, mm -hmm. but it gradually sugarcane, particularly once the Europeans discover sugar beet, uh, the sugar cane industry declines and the coffee takes over. Mm -hmm. We go back to that point about, you know, how do you plant more and more coffee? Well, you do this very cheap, and of course, in the first place, you do it very cheap by having a slave labor force that you just have to feed and house, but you don't have to pay. When was slavery officially abolished in Brazil? It's a slow process, but the first and most critical thing to say is Brazil is the last of the sort of the recognized Western nations to abolish slavery. Slavery isn't completely abolished until 1888. Right. 1888, that is a long, long time. Mm. 
So Jonathan, what I'd love to do is zoom in down into one of these giant coffee plantations in Brazil. How big is big? So I'm going to give you the example of the man who owns the most coffee in Brazil in 1905. And that man is called Francesco Schmidt. What a, what a, what a bizarre name. Yes, it's a German surname because he's from German stock. I think he is second generation Francesco. So they've given him the Francesco from being in Brazil. And Francesco has 5 million coffee trees. Work that out. Five million coffee trees. How do I comprehend this? Well, I've just realised I understated Francesco. Francesco had seven million. <laughs> what's, well, at this point, what's the difference? Francesco had 29,000 hectares of coffee fazenda. That is 290 kilometers squared. That is pretty much Malta. Jeez, an entire country of coffee growing. Pretty much, yeah. Wild. Yeah, he could, he could have joined the EU. One thing that I'm struggling with here is we look at coffee prices. So coffee prices were about, what, $2 a pound back in 1870. Yeah. You know, slavery is going out of fashion. But somehow, after slavery is abolished, the coffee price continues to go down and down and down. Correct. The major expansion of production is post that point. Well, how does that work? The big issue is, well, how are we going to replace this labour or how are we going to change our structures? And the way they change the structures is to move to a policy of bringing in indentured labour, so indebted labour. Right. And I mean, you're in the same sort of territory as what we now call modern slavery, because you're in this territory of having ever augmenting debt that you are supposed to work off, mm. which you can't work off. So the spiral continues and continues. Mm. So by 1905, 65% of the workers on coffee farms were foreign born. So 65% of that population has moved to Brazil, to Sao Paulo, to farm coffee has been bought in to do that. Wow. That's the sort of level of scale 65% that we're talking about. 65% of the workforce. 65% of the workforce. <laughs> That's, yeah. weren't born in Brazil. Yeah. And are going to reside permanently in Brazil, I'm assuming, once they arrive. They're not going to go back. Yes, there's certainly very few of them are going to go back. It's the emigrant dream. If anything, probably they're going to aim to one day be able to bring their family over, etc. And give me a sense of the, when you sell the new frontier dream. Yeah. Hey, listen, you can do some hard yards, some hard work, but one day you will have a plot of land to call your own. That's exactly what you sell. And that's a very, very powerful image if you're stuck as a sharecropper or an agricultural peasant deep in the depression of Europe or on the lands in Japan. It's a powerful promise. So does that mean we see vast tracts of land being all subdivided into little plots of coffee? No. We don't see that. Probably about a third of the total land is probably relatively small scale farms. Right. But I mean, the top 20% of farmers, if you like, own 80% of the land. Wow. There are many small scale farms, but they are completely overshadowed by this large scale agriculture. That today is still the case, I believe. It's certainly the case that the inequalities are massive in Brazil and also that there are big, big industrialized estates where it is possible to sort of use mechanized tools. Again, this is the thing about Brazil being relatively flat mm -hmm. and they are absolutely enormous. So Jonathan, as we enter you know, the 20th century. Who is coming over into Brazil to work these farms? Basically, they are peasants from Europe. Hmm. So Portugal is one, hmm. uh, some from Germany, some from Eastern Europe, but Italy 
in particular. Italy is the primary supplier of people and, of course, a really interesting country to talk about. So why so many from Italy? Italy had at that time a lot of overpopulation in backward agricultural areas. But the Italian government actually refused to allow emigrants to be sponsored onto those schemes to Brazil by about, I think it's 1902, because the schemes were so unfair. Huh. Now, that's quite a big statement from an Italian government at that time, because there's plenty of reason for them to want to encourage people to leave. The poverty in Italy itself is very desperate. And in fact, those emigres from Europe gradually become replaced also with emigres from Japan. So I've told you all of that, and now I want to tell you one more thing, because it's quite important. Mm -hmm. What happened to the enslaved people? Because the answer is actually really sad. Mm. So these enslaved people who are now freed, where are they going to get a livelihood? And the answer is they enter into contracts pretty similar to the ones under which they were enslaved. In other words, that they basically still work for these estate owners on the principle of being fed and maintained in subsistence. Wow. And indeed, there is an interpretation of Brazilian history at this point that goes, why did they recruit all these people from Europe and Asia? Answer, because that sort of led to a whitening of the community. All right, so Jonathan, you shared with me an image here, and it's of a train. Yeah. And there are all these workers, and they're kind of grabbing these sacks of coffee, you know, 67 kilo sacks of coffee, and they're throwing them down this chute, this hole. We've talked about creating a supply chain under colonialism, but now what we're talking about is really creating an industrial system. You know, the amazing amount of work that's being done in terms of building up of the port, building up a system where the coffee arrives into the port, can get straight onto the freight as it kind of goes almost through an underground railway type system at one point. So it dumps out onto the ships. We talk about steamship, the telegraph system, which comes in the 1870s so that we have much closer coordination. The other thing to say, of course, is we have a banking and a credit system that's tied together. A lot of that is, you know, we have European and American banking houses and large speculative monies going in and out of Santos. The creation of an extremely wealthy, and I mean extremely wealthy, the people on a parallel with Francesco and his seven million trees, similarly sort of hugely wealthy merchants in the port itself, these sort of barons. So we're building a whole infrastructure really this is the infrastructure of this system whereby ultimately coffee gets quicker and quicker and cheaper and cheaper and so jonathan if we were to like zoom out and take stock of what's happening in brazil so you have these railroads and they're like cutting into the interior of brazil and the deeper these railroads go the further coffee spreads so, I mean, technology is enabling the rapid destruction of virgin land. And the more you grow, the more supply there is, and the price drops. Now, when I contrast that to the last episode, you know, we saw how slavery contributed to a much lower coffee price. And there, you know, human lives were being squeezed to get a cheaper cup of coffee. And it feels like at this time in history, in Brazil, you know, it's the environment that's getting squeezed to get a cheaper cup of coffee. Absolutely, yes. I mean, you're absolutely right. The environment is transformed and a lot of things lose on that basis because if you really want to see the price for this, it's not just the price of all the coffee trees, it's the price of those areas where the coffee is exhausted. So if we go back to the area around Rio, there's a lot of coffee produced in Rio in the sort of the second half of the 19th century. And then it really, really drops in terms of production. Partly that's because of the coming on of what we might call Santos and Sao Paulo, partly because basically it's worked out. The land's exhausted. The land's exhausted, can't produce coffee of the quality that's coming elsewhere. It's, it's, it's done. It's done for. Wow. 
If you ever tasted Rio coffee, you know that Rio is the name for a fault in coffee. Oh, really? Yeah, mouldy. Basically, it smells mouldy because it because the standard of production and the coffee quality. So, Jonathan, I wanted to kind of connect the flavors of Brazilian coffee to the story. So I put some beans from Brazil, roasted by friends of the show Supremo, which is a roaster in southern Germany. And, you know, put through my commandant there and I just like, brewed it up now on a V60. And I got to say, it's tasting pretty good. I put it through the sage grinder and made it as a French press. Very pleasant. Yeah, and this Boa Vista has this classic Brazilian profile. It's quite nutty. I really got that in the aroma. Mm. Tell you what, though, James, what made this a bit of a specialty coffee moment for me, unlike some Brazilians, this also has lovely fruit notes mm. in it. You know, these flavors here, your fruit notes, my nutty notes, we're talking about the drinking of Brazilian coffee. Now, Brazil is producing, you know, a huge amount of coffee. And let's explore who was drinking it 100 years ago. Well, that's uh, a fairly simple answer. We were talking about the height of Brazilian coffee in the 1900s. And at that time, you know, Brazil is making 80% plus of the world's coffee and 70% plus of that Brazilian coffee just goes to one market and that's the United States. But how does the US all of a sudden just start drinking so much coffee? It's not like they wake up one morning. It's like, you know, I really fancy a cup of coffee. <laughs> okay, so I know that America, you know, in the 1700s, it has a very small population. But I mean, the population explodes over the next couple of hundred years and a lot of people come over from Europe. Does that have something to do with American love affair with coffee? Actually, it is the big expansion of migration from Europe to the US again in the second half of the 19th century, you know, find the immigrant dream, the dream of America. These people, you know, what do they associate with success? Well, one of that is being able to drink coffee. Are you saying the American dream is based on the idea that everyone can afford a cup of coffee? <laughs> I think that that becomes a part of the American dream and is, is one that's fulfilled. Hmm. By the 1940s, 98% of US households report drinking coffee. So, you know, it is part of the American dream in that sense. Wow. But at one point... Americans weren't drinking as much coffee. So how did it go from a state of not drinking so much to 98% of all households drinking coffee? Well, if we look at consumption per capita, number of pounds of coffee. Right. In 1800, it's about one and a half, 1.65. In 1830, it's just under three. In 1860, we're at 5.78. So we're pushing six. Yeah. So let me just be clear about this. Between 1800 and 1860... Coffee consumption per person goes up from one and a half pounds to six pounds in like 60 years. So we're seeing some fairly rapid increases. And that's about the point that I think industrialization really kicks in. And then by 1920, we're up to just under 12 pounds per capita. Yeah. Wow. So from six to 12 in those 60 years. And if we want to just finish that off... Mm -hmm. The 1950s, probably about £16 per capita, with some points reaching £19. So we're seeing a massive, massive increase. Okay, so Jonathan, let me just put that into perspective. Okay, so I drink three cups of coffee a day. That's 30 grams of coffee. Do the maths. That is about 11 kilos of coffee a year. About £24. So if the average American is drinking £19 of coffee a year, the average American... That means the average American is kind of like me. They are heavy coffee drinkers. Yeah, it became a very caffeinated society. There are several stages on the way to that. So I want to point to one big thing, and that is the American Civil War. Mm. Now, the American Civil War was not a war for coffee, but one side had coffee and one side didn't. And the side that did, the Union side, they absolutely pumped their soldiers full of coffee. Right. 
because this is the thing that provides them with a hint of pleasure, a hint of domesticity in a very difficult situation. But it's also something that keeps them awake, that keeps them alert, that makes them good fighters. So their generals absolutely push it through. So to give you a very interesting stat, if you go through the diaries of Civil War soldiers, okay, you will find the word coffee more frequently than you will find the word rifle or bullet (laughs) or gun, right? So this is how much it matters. There's a very famous memoir of an ordinary, as it were, combatant on the Union side. What's it called? Hard Tack and Coffee. Hmm. And he says, you know, we have coffee all the time. We had coffee before every meal. We have coffee during every meal. We have coffee after every meal. When we go on a march, we start out with a coffee because it gets us going. We have a coffee when we finish. You know, if you look at the camp at night, all you'll see is lots and lots of fires with people brewing coffee. They put up the ration to the point that you could probably, certainly using the amounts that they were given in those days, make about 10 cups of coffee a day. 10 cups a day. Obviously, a big potential demand, because when these people go back to society, the habit is ingrained. So we have a transition from green coffee, where everyone's roasting their green coffee themselves. But then at some point, the roasting aspect of that is taken away from the household yeah. and is done by a company. If I went down to my local green grocers and I looked at the quality of the fruit to make a smoothie, it's like, oh, I want this apple because it's really ripe. Yeah. And I'm going to make my apple smoothie. But then that gets transformed to, no, here is a pre-packaged, ready-made apple smoothie for you. You can buy off the shelf. Yeah. And that's the same thing that happens with coffee roasting. Yeah. And what's very interesting, James, is that you've actually hit on one of the ways in which this coffee was marketed. One of the first big marketers is Arbuckles. And their adverts, they have things like, you know, a picture of a woman going, oh, no, I've burnt my coffee again. And the gentle friend says, ah, there's no need for this. You know, just buy your coffee pre-roasted, buy Arbuckles. They roast it perfectly every time. There's no shame, the new messing up. And this is an absolute trope of coffee advertising and marketing. Throughout most of this industrial period, which is to say, we know what we're doing and you'll just mess it up. So just rely on us and use our stuff and then it will all be okay. And a lot of it is very targeted at housewives, at newly married women. Right. You know, are you going to get your husband's coffee right? Are you going to make sure your husband's coffee is okay? What if your husband doesn't like the coffee? Oh, my God, you don't know how to make coffee, right? Oh, listen, it's a breeze. Just buy us. We've got it sorted for you. We've got it covered for you. Do we have a sense of the scale of the industrialization of roasting of coffee? The industrial scale at which coffee is roasted? By about the 1920s, we've got about 5,000 enterprises that roast, but three of them hold 40% of the US coffee market. Wow. And that is A&P, Maxwell House, and Chase and Sanborn. But of course, both Maxwell House and Chase and Sanborn, by that time, having started as independent operations in the sort of 1890s, 1870s, are owned by huge mega corporations. I'm picturing gigantic corporations roasting gigantic quantities of coffee in America. And I'm picturing gigantic plantations (laughs) growing gigantic quantities of coffee over in Brazil. Yeah. I think we can see an image of this, the Arbuckles Roasting Facility in New York, where I believe they had something like 65, 70 industrial roasting machines operating at the same time. Wow. This is roasting on a scale that's never been seen before. So, Jonathan, you shared with me a postcard, I believe. Yes. Which is a bit of a marketing thing. So this looks like an eight-story factory with chimneys spurting out black fumes into the sky yeah you have a giant ship on a dock nearby yeah and down below it says 839,972 pounds roasted daily basically 
840,000 pounds of coffee roasted a day. Wow. That's, <laughs> what, what, that's what? staggering. And I'm very tempted, James, because you always do this to me, to, to sort of throw you back and do the math and say, turn all that number of pounds into something that we can think about. Well, we know that I drink 24 pounds of coffee a year. So 840,000 divided by 24 is 35,000. In one day, this factory roasts enough coffee to keep 35,000 mees caffeinated for a whole year. Wow, that, that, that's a really useful thank you for that. And now you can picture me drinking coffee 35,000 times. It's pretty terrifying. Let me, let me <laughs> and on that note, I'll just drink another cup of coffee. You do that. Um, but also what's interesting is that this is a huge concentration of coffee roasting happening in one place. But again, in Brazil, there are coffee farms the size of Malta. Yeah. And I see these two things going hand in hand. Absolutely. It's what I would call a symbiotic relationship, yeah? Mm. The one feeds the other, and it's a circular thing. Industrialization of growing and the industrialization of roasting. Exactly so. And in between, if you don't mind me saying, almost the industrialization of trading. It's no accident that that factory is on the banks of the river in New York. Mm. That's where the coffee is coming in, being shipped in, but it's also where the money that's trading that coffee is coming from. So Jonathan, you know, an awful lot of money is being produced. And it seems to me a quite unequal system, both on the growing and on the roasting, where you have a handful of companies and individuals who control the majority of the growing and the same on the roasting. Yeah. And so a lot of the profit in the coffee industry going towards a handful of people or companies. I think what I would say is what you have is the outlines of the modern industry and the oval of modern capitalism. Of course, you don't see enslaved labor anymore or indentured labor, but this thing whereby we have huge numbers of people at one end of the supply chain mm -hmm. and huge numbers of people at the other. So huge numbers of producers, huge numbers of consumers, producers in all forms, as in workers and consumers in all forms, all those ordinary people buying their coffee, and in the middle, the funnel, as it were, that funnels it down, funnels it down into Santos and funnels it out again from New York or Houston or wherever it's landed. That sort of funnel in, funnel out, and that is what our system still looks like. Now, you could say that's what any capitalist commodity chain system looks like, but that is certainly how the coffee chain looks at this point. So Jonathan, hand in hand, we have coffee growing in Brazil at a frightening rate and you have the consumption of coffee in america growing at a frightening rate and the two of them are going hand in hand yeah so tell me why on earth am i looking at an image right now that you sent me it's a bunch of people in brazil we're at the front of a steam engine and they're throwing flammable material into the engine to move the thing forward but they're not throwing coal in there no they're throwing coffee they're throwing coffee mixed with a bit of petroleum because they've got to get rid of the coffee this is the huge problem that faced Brazil when oversupply outstrips demand hmm. and they had become desperate to take any measure to stop it depressing the price too much. Now, in the 30s, we have a combination of Brazil's biggest ever coffee harvests and, of course, the Wall Street crash and the Great Depression destroying demand. Ah... Uh... And the resultant problem for the Brazilian government is how the hell do we keep the coffee price at a level where it's still profitable for the country? Hmm. So what do you do? You know, you've got too much coffee. Well, what you do is get rid of the coffee. You try finding other uses for it. Well, one use they tried was, you know, let's see if we can power our trains with it. 
They tried to make it into cattle feed, apparently, which um, wow, that would have been a, 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 <laughs> the poor got cows. Some pretty, pretty wired cows. Unsurprisingly, that didn't work. Poor animals. But I mean, the two basic things that they did were destroy it, destroy it by burn it, or destroy it by dumping it in the sea. In the 30s, the Brazilian state set up huge incineration plants, about 75 of them. Right. And to give you the indication of the scale, they burnt the equivalent of three years' global supply of coffee. Right? Wow. Three years of global supply because there was that much over. Now, Jonathan, I, I was only born in the 80s, but even during my lifetime, there have been many price crashes in coffee. Yeah. This dislocation that we see between supply and demand happened in the 1930s, which led to the burning of coffee on trains in Brazil. Yeah. So this is the beginning of what seems to be a recurring trend for the next 100 years. It is the start of the boom and bust economy in coffee. Stimulus of expanding market then collapsed through oversupply. Rebalancing through some kind of catastrophe and we're back where we start. And what's extraordinary is how this disconnect between supply and demand, it leads to a whole bunch of different things. Yeah. But one of them is a dark bitter powder. In so many ways. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so it seems like the next 60 years of coffee history, which we're going to cover in the next episode, begins at this point of severe dislocation between supply and demand and leads to, amongst other things, the specialty coffees that we are drinking right now, like this uh, Boa Vista Brazilian from our friends at Supremo. Well, you know what? I'm going to say I'm delighted that something as nice as the Boa Vista has come out of that. Mm. But I think we're going to see that there is a pretty big cost. <clears throat> Join us next time <laughs> in another edition of Coffee History. Thank you for listening to this episode of A History of Coffee. If you would like to listen to the next episode, episode four, it is actually already out on the A History of Coffee podcast channel. Head over there. There's a link in the show notes. Click subscribe. Now, I've put images of Brazilian coffee farms on my Instagram channel at Filter Stories Podcast. And I have put it up on my Instagram channel at Coffee History JM. Images of Americans drinking coffee, particularly during the times of the Civil War. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our Instagram live session where we explore what the British were doing in Ceylon, modern day Sri Lanka, with coffee. And if you want to dive deeper into any of these stories, I also highly recommend checking out Jonathan's book, Coffee, A Global History. And we've put a link in the show notes. Thanks, James. And in fact, I'm going to give away one copy of Coffee, A Global History. <gasps> If people would like to write a review on Apple Podcasts, tell us what story resonated with them the most. We'll draw one at random from those reviews and a copy of the book will be sent to them. But of course, you're all anonymous on Apple Podcasts. So send a screen grab of your review to me at hello at filterstories.org and we'll choose an email at random and then get in touch for further details. This podcast was produced by myself and James. <laughs>
and it was James who wrote and played the piano music. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening, and we'll speak to you next time.